if we can go ahead and, and kick things off. Well, first and foremost, greetings everyone and welcome to our fourth and final installment of the 2021 True Equity Conversation Series. It is such a pleasure to be with you all this evening. My name is Brandon Kyle and I'm the Executive Director of Alumni and Family Engagement and Annual Giving here at Pitzer College. And again, thank you so much for joining us. As I mentioned, tonight is the culmination of the four unique conversations about systemic racial injustice, lived experiences, community coalitions, and fundamental change at Pitzer College and in the U.S. This series was initiated by the college, by the Office of Advancement in College Communications at Pitzer College, and was in response to President Oliver's racial justice initiative and our shared desire to create uh, equity throughout our institution in our lifetimes. Uh, True Equity Part 1 actually launched over Family Weekend uh, of this year and discussed systemic change with the reflective conversation about the racial wealth gap, Pitzer's racial justice initiative, and the need for radical imagination to create a multiracial democracy. True Equity Part 2, Color in the Ivory Tower, examined a frank conversation about the state of diversity at Pitzer College and higher education and was led by members of Pitzer College faculty and moderated by Associate Dean and Professor Adrian Pantoja. True Equity Part 3, entitled Our Stories, Pitzer's inaugural Black Alumni Caucus, which highlighted lived experiences of Black students, now alumni, uh, parts of the college and actionable next steps for holding our core values through accountability, community, and resolution to create equity for the next generation. And now tonight we bring to you part four of the series entitled Beyond Solidarity, Awareness, Accountability, and Action. This conversation will explore pathways forward that reach beyond just rhetoric and, ste and are steeped in sustainable change. For uh, the, this important conversation, for this important discussion rather, our panelists for tonight include a return of many of our panelists from the first three segments and include the following, of course, Pitzer College President Melvin Oliver, Angela Blackwell, Pitzer College trustee and founder of Policy Link, Jackie Campos Arroyo, uh, co-president of the Latinx Student Union and member of the class of 2023, Derek Johnson, class of 95, alumni board member and director of the Crossroads for Equity and Justice Institute. Paris Prem, president of the Black Student Union in class of, the of 2022, my goodness. And Julia Weber, uh, parent of class of 2023, family leadership council member and consultant and implementation directly, director of the Giffords Law Center. I am so honored to be able to bring this panel together and to share this with our community and look forward uh, to where tonight's discussion will lead us. My intention for tonight's discussion is to highlight the importance of equity and inclusion within our community, but to also shine a spotlight on where we can go as a collective in pursuit of advancing the very core values that we believe in. With that said, I think a good place to start is actually from the very beginning. So um, President Oliver, this question goes to you but I want to give a little bit of context before we get into that. So during our first True Equity event, Systemic Change, in, in February, you said one of the goals of the Racial Justice Initiative was to, quote, uh, institutionalize something, make something happen that is going to be here beyond the speeches. You said, and I quote again, one of the things we need to do is not just have an upheaval of anguish and concern when things happen, but to move forward when things happen. In many ways, those words sum up the idea behind this fourth part of the series, Beyond Solidarity, Awareness, Act, Accountability, and Action. Could you speak a little bit about why you think that it's so important to move forward and institutionalize change before, during, and after issues related to racial injustice into our community? Um, thank you for that question, uh, Brandon. Um, I think it's crystal clear that um, we can, um, of course, have a lot of discussion and talk about doing things, but unless we put, us, put ourselves on the path to making um, identifiable concrete change, um, you know, talk is cheap. And um, we've had um, some opportunity to go beyond talk um, since um, the the events uh, surrounding the the, the killing uh, killings uh, police killings and my announcement of this uh, uh, initiative, our black 
a student union, Latinx uh, student union, they brought forth to us uh, genuine issues, um, issues that um, we have tried to um, address. And I would say that um, we have been mixed in responding to those. Um, that's not um, a grade uh, of mixed, but it is just what's reality. These are hard things to do. Um, and sometimes they take a great deal of time and effort. The first thing we have to do is recognize the problem is, is, is there. And I think uh, part of having these conversations is educating people about those problems, making them aware of them. And uh, certainly the Black Student Union and the Latinx Student Union have helped the campus do that. Uh, but we also have to know what the root causes are. Um, and once we know that, we can um, generate the political will on campus to do something about it and then come up with a strategy that can address it. Um, I think we're mixed in, in where we're at in those things. Sometimes we identify a problem, but we don't have a good sense of what the strategy is for um, dealing with it. Other times we identify a problem, we understand the root cause, but we don't have the necessary or sufficient uh, political will or empathy to do it. If we empathize with this problem, we will go towards strategy. And then we can do all these things and strategy can be wrong. We can be at the point where we don't get uh, the results that we want. And we have to kind of you know, re reconsider where we're at um, and, and, and go forward. So I think just as in society as a whole, Pitzer College has that kind of mixed set of results. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, Angela, this question is actually uh, geared toward you. So during that initial conversation, uh, part one of the True Equity series, you mentioned that people are realizing now more than ever that we can't run away from racism and that the only way to deal with it is to go right through it. You mentioned, and I quote, we're now at a point where we have so many entry points, similar to the Racial Justice Initiative, putting something in place that will have the ability to change and become more flexible over time. My question to you this evening is, when you're starting from what feels like the beginning of your journey, what would you say are some of those important entry points for creating systemic change? And what advice would you give to students or other community members who may be struggling in the interim? Mm. It's always so funny to, when people tell me something that I've said, because I never remember saying it, but I like that. <laughs> I like that idea of multiple <laughs> entry points, because <laughs> um, there really are multiple entry points and they have really come at us all of a sudden. I was telling somebody the other day that I have been doing this work for so long that I had become chronically patient. Mm. You know, that I had developed patience as a way to be effective, but somehow that patience had just settled in. And I was startled and awakened by the Black Lives Matter response in the summer of 2020. Um, and what I found once I really said, we don't need to be patient anymore, is that those entry points were being used being crowded in terms of people trying to come in. And, the re and there's really no particular entry point now. Not only can you enter from any place, but you must enter from wherever you stand. There is nothing that doesn't have something to do with race in this nation. And if you are doing anything, just look around and get started. And so you don't need to guide people in. Uh, we probably do need a little guidance for people in terms of how to be effective because some people just come in screaming and I get the screams. I mean, that's why I became chronically patient. I couldn't have lasted if I had let out what I had been feeling all along. But somewhere in the middle is the being aware, being outraged, being determined to act and then having a plan for action that allows you to be able to be more strategic, to have 
um, strategic patients, not chronic patients, but strategic patients as you're moving from one place to another. So when you say how people enter, everybody has to enter. If you haven't entered, you're not dealing in tomorrow. You're barely dealing in today. But as we enter, we need to have commitment, as uh, Melvin was just saying, about accomplishing something, being able to look back and check a few boxes. And you need to have a, a style and a and, a, and an approach to be able to accomplish that. Oh my goodness, thank you. Um, it's, it's powerful. This is going to be a really short conversation. Thank you so much, Angela. All right, our next question is for Julia. Um, as a member of the Family Leadership Council and in the work that you do, that you produce both professionally and personally around equity and advocacy outside of the community. Uh, you and Derek uh, both have been able to spearhead this important series of conversations, resulting in increased awareness. Uh, during those conversations, one of the things that you highlighted, you shed light on, was the importance of ally, true allyship, and doing the work necessary to be active parts of the solution versus sort of in, in quote, in name only solidarity. From your perspective, what is the difference between true allyship and performative allyship, and how can we as a community hold ourselves accountable? Well, thank you for another great question, Brandon. And um, it's a it's a pleasure and an honor to be here today. Um, you know, in terms of entry points uh, and and in reference to your question, I, I would just say, you know, I, I come to this discussion as, you know, first uh, a parent of a student of color who was warmly welcomed to the Pitzer community as a prospective student and uh, has found a wonderful community there and is thriving uh, at Pitzer College. Um, and because of that, I'm part of the extended Pitzer community and a member of the Family Leadership Council of the committees. And, um, you know, I also come to this as a, a white woman who believes that white folks have a key role to play in dismantling racism. Um, and that means doing whatever I can in all of the different communities I'm a part of, uh, which includes Pitzer College. Um, and then also as a, I work as an adjunct professor and a former lecturer at another university. And um, I've spent a lot of time on campuses and I have a deep appreciation for what makes Pitzer College unique and special. And part of that is what uh, President Oliver, you shared early on just being able to uh, say we have a mixed response and approach that's an educational opportunity to learn what we could do better uh, to make that kind of commitment to make ourselves vulnerable around those issues and I think that's one of the many ways that we can be working collaboratively those of us who don't have lived experiences of direct racism um, are still living in a society, a community that is diminished uh, by the reality of racism. And it behooves all of us to uh, be real about that, to recognize where we may benefit from some of it, be willing to unpack that, uh, let go of some of that, of, of, of much of it, and um, you know, take the steps we can take to counteract uh, structural racism. And so that means being real, learning about your position in the system, um, where you benefit, uh, where you might have resources that you can bring to bear to uh, be the kind of change we want to see in the world, um, and being willing to step up and uh, take those kinds of those actions. And sometimes that might be hard, uh, we all have sort of romantic ideals of how we want our country to be, how we might have thought it was. Uh, I think much has been revealed to uh, people who may not have been as clued in about what we're living with in this country, um, certainly in the last few years. And uh, my hope would be that a real allyship would develop out of that, um, as opposed to just giving lip service. And And I appreciate being part of an educational environment where I think that's where it can happen, that we want to be genuine, we want to learn, we want to do that without harming other people that, you know, we don't uh, learn at the expense of others. Um, so it's not just about sharing different differing points of view. Uh, there are points of view that do harm, and we need to be real about that too. So 
I think a lot of it is being genuine, becoming informed, looking at how one uh, oneself fits into the system, and uh, then being able to take the next steps, uh, the actions that are necessary, depending on what our entry points are and what we bring to the conversation. Thank you so much, Julia. So we'll shift gears a little bit now. We kind of want to create some space for to hear a little bit from our students here on the call today. Um, Jackie, this question is geared toward you. Um, so nearly a year apart, the glaring similarities of the two statements released to the community from the Black Student Union and the Latinx Student Union showcase two segments of our community that were seeking support, security, and the core values promised to them as prospective students. From your perspective, what stands out to you the most about the calls to action presented by the Latinx Student Union? And from your position as co-president, what would you say are the main points of the of that important communication that you'd like for people to remember? Yeah, thank you, Brandon, for the question. And I'm so honored to be here, a part of these panelists. And yes, um, one of the things that stood out to me from like both statements is the part where we asked um, to speak and have a conversation with President Oliver and like the community, um, the leadership at Pitzer College. And I think that stood out to me because I feel like, yes, we should have like these conversations, but a lot of these conversations come after incidents that just happened. And I feel like one of the biggest things that could for a, a step forward is having these conversations prior to incidents. So we like, I feel like having these conversations would have a bigger impact in creating a safe space um, for us to be able to talk about what had happened. And I think that would that well, that's one thing that really stood out to me from both statements. And I really appreciate that we had the capability to talk to with President Oliver and having that conversation really helped us um, understand and collaborating and working together to see what are the steps to create a safe environment. But I think one of the things is having those conversations prior to these incidents. The ability to be proactive in these situations. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Um, as like the um, co-president of LSU, one of the things like when this incident happened on campus, I, me and Yvette, um, who is the other LSU president, we were both, um, you know, like when we were here, um, the last time we were at Pitzer was our freshman year. So coming as juniors now that we haven't been on campus for a while and having this incident and like the position that we hold, obviously like we had to bring like a, a statement now, but we looked at each other and we had like no idea what to say or what to do and how to speak for like um, the whole club at itself. So that was very difficult, but at the same time, um, I'm glad that we were able to have that conversation with President Oliver after. Seeking the support of the community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Um, so, Paris, um, I should have shift gears to you a little bit. During the part three of True Equity, which you participated in as a panelist, um, you talked about joining BSU early on in your college career and how important it was uh, to sort of creating your own space of community as well as being able to connect with the Office of Black Student Affairs and other Black student organizations within the Claremont Consortium. You call BSU, quote, your safe haven. Can you talk a little bit about the role uh, BSU has played during your time at Pitzer and also share some ideas about the ways that college can maybe create more campus wide, more of a campus wide sense of belonging? Hello, everyone. Thank you, Brandon, for the question. I'm really excited um, and honored to be here as well. Um, BSU has definitely always um, been a safe haven for me. Of course, we are right here um, in our space. Um, I did join BSU um, and also like our exec board um, my first year and have been, been working, have been organizing since, uh, since my first year and I'm very honored to serve um, as president um, right now. So seeing a lot of things happen um, across campus, but I've always known that I can always come in here um, be be within um, a community outside of our institution. Um, so that's always been that's always been amazing. Um, and being in BSU was also like such an integral part to my academic experience as well, um, and definitely influenced um, me becoming an African Studies major, um, and also me completing my thesis on Black student organizing um, in Claremont. So um, this definitely is highly highly influential um, to my experience. Um, as a whole here. And 
I think one way um, Pitzer can uh, create a create a better sense of belonging is definitely like even beginning um, in orientation. First, uh, I've been an orientation leader as well. It's always fun, um, but it's always kind of like, oh, we have like one diversity and inclusion um, activity, or there could be one activity um, around like for like identity board. Like it's always kind of one thing and it's just one thing that's here, but how can we, um, like for example, just for example, orientation programs, like creating like core several like programs um, towards interacting with your affinity groups and your spaces, um, like as a first year, instead of waiting. until trying to figure out, oh, when is the meeting time? Um, be highlighted um, towards, well, I, think I'm all, um, I hope I'm all good. I just got the, your internet is unstable message. It's been for a little bit. Okay. Okay, okay, that's good. I hope, I hope it all got through. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, thank you, Paris. Uh, I, will, I will also just uh, share that both Paris and Jackie are probably two of the most busy uh, but incredible students I've had the honor of working with. So again, just thank you both for being here this evening. Um, so we'll, we'll shift gear and hear a little bit from the, our alumni perspective. Derek, this question is, is geared toward you. Um, so during part three of the Center of True Equity uh, conversation, we hosted the Pitzer's uh, inaugural Black Alumni Caucus conversation, which presented interge intergenerational conversations about the lived experiences of Black students, now alums of Pitzer College. As an alumnus of the class of, of 95 who dealt with similar experiences of racial injustice, what do you find most challenging to still process about what students of color are still facing today? And what advice would you give to students who feel exhausted from having to be both activists and educators while also being students? How do they find their support systems? Well, first, I want to give uh, uh, flowers to everyone who's here tonight and engaged in this conversation. Again, uh, your uh, commitment and leadership to advance these issues and actually have this dialogue uh, is critical. Um, I think that that actually links to a portion of what you just asked, uh, Brandon, about being present, uh, about being uh, responsive and accountable, um, and holding an institution like Pitzer uh, to uh, task, holding them up to the principles of what it takes to educate uh, a young leaders and to make sure that there are mechanisms in place where folks are receiving the supports that they need in order to uh, matriculate into adulthood into the leaders of, of tomorrow. Uh, so I think the, the correlation of maybe, well, let me just first say, I got into this whole project because I had come uh, uh, it was a couple of years ago. I think we were, it was a family weekend. This was before the world imploded uh, and uh, COVID had everything shut down. Uh, but I was on campus just walking around. And personally, uh, I hadn't been on campus in probably 20 plus years, right? Because of my own lived experience on campus uh, and the things that we fought for. Uh, so it was almost, uh, it was almost like um, a revisiting a place of trauma. Right. And so it was uh, interesting to run into a group of students who, one, thought I was a parent and I was there visiting uh, a student there uh, who happened to be my child, but I was not. Uh, and then they were really shocked uh, and uh, enamored the fact that there was somebody who was African-American who actually was a student there that was on campus, because I think that the pipeline uh, for the current students in terms of uh, 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 you know, again, future leaders tomorrow to be linked with uh, alumni who had essentially been on campus and had that lived experience. Those mechanisms of communication uh, had been fragmented. Uh, and so what struck me was the fact that, you know, some odd years ago when I was a student there, we were having these same conversations about who do we connect with? What are our networks? Who do we align with? Who do we go to for guidance? Uh, if we were looking to try to get jobs, who specifically were those pipeline uh, access points uh, for us to uh, gain experience, internships, that whole deal. Uh, and it was striking that, you know, we were having some of the same conversations. I was having some of the same conversations with students that uh, uh, me and my um, classmates were having back in uh, the 90s. And so, 
you know, one of the things that was appealing to me about these conversations and again, um, uh, kudos and shout out to President Oliver for elevating this as a focal point uh, for what the institution is looking to do to try to address those issues uh, is to be proximate and actually be engaged in the conversations uh, and to make myself available and, and tie into the Black alumni network that exists that also is not connected to the institution current. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, Julia, this question is, is for you. Um, in our first conversation, you spoke about the importance of understanding history. Uh, quote, in order to really be able to think strategically about what this moment means and how to move forward most effectively. My question to you this evening is what advice would you give to students and or other community members about the importance of understanding both the history of our institution and our society? Well, I would certainly say uh, institutionally, I think the series has been you know, invaluable in terms of, you know, hearing from Derek and the alums, for example, hearing from the students about their current experience, but also going back and looking historically, um, uh, you know, what's changed, what hasn't, why things haven't changed, what we can do about that. That's very informative, I think. Um, you know, and then similarly, I thought the faculty conversation uh, was very informative thinking about what has come before this moment. And, you know, as an activist, I think um, I have benefited enormously from people who did the work long before I showed up, uh, understanding uh, what challenges they encountered, the strategies that they developed. Um, I always enjoy when we have interns or uh, new folks coming into the organization where I work, I like to sit down with them and talk about what social movements, what what uh, experiences that were going on in the broader world led them to social justice work. Uh, you know, I, I end up talking a lot about growing up in the 70s, uh, the, the women's rights movement, the civil rights movement, uh, the AIDS crisis, uh, you know, efforts to um, uh, address LGBTQ plus rights access um, they often talk about, you know, experiences with um, school violence and, you know, as I work in the gun violence prevention world and, um, you know, just different experiences that led them, you know, much more greater attention to issues related to police misconduct, for example. So in having those conversations, we can learn a lot about, you know, the perspective that people bring and also, uh, you know, strategies, what works, what doesn't work. Um, and we can get very creative, which I think is an important part of it. We need that patience that Angela, you talked about, uh, that I think can develop over time. We also need the feeling of immediacy that I think, uh, students often bring to these issues that this has to happen now I'm here for a limited period of time and I want to make a difference in my community. Um, and we can get some perspective on, uh, we're not alone, you know, there's a whole history of folks who have come before and have stood up and made the world uh, better in many ways for us. So that's also inspiring, you know, you can get very um, frustrated, um, but there are plenty of examples of folks who have come before in history that I think really can lend itself to um, inspiration. Uh, I think that's important too. And I, and I also would say, I want to counteract the uh, notion of immediacy at the same time, you know, that this isn't all going to be fixed tomorrow. We're not going to have a solution by the end of this conversation for the issues that we're dealing with, but we can do more to strengthen our community. Uh, and I, I do see that as a role for family members too here, which is strengthening the community for our individual students, for, for their peers now, and then for the future, because the more we can do in this moment, we can change what that history looks like in the future too, right? So I, I just think that's really important and that and that will make the, the institution stronger overall. I agree that perspectives move us forward, absolutely. Um, so President Oliver, this question, this next question is, is for you. Um, so now nearly a year and a half, I can't believe you're saying that, but a year and a half after the launch of the Racial Justice Initiative back in May of 2020, 
under the leadership of Professor and Associate Dean of Faculty, Adrian Pantoa, we've not only seen the creation of new resources, um, more than 40 speakers, events, and high-profile lectures, but also the creation of over two dozen courses funded by RJI after the call for proposals from faculty to create or redo their courses to include racial justice and racial violence issues, uh, courses ranging from sociology to economics. From your perspective, how do those new and redesigned courses now a part of the curriculum help infuse racial justice throughout the, throughout the college? And what are you most proud of over a little, a little over a year after launching RJ Oh, you're, you're on mute. <laughs> it's okay. I'll, I'll go back to my original comments is that you, you need to have a sense of what the problem are problems are and awareness of the problems. Uh, the integration of um, issues of racism, violence um, into the curriculum um, forms a basis for our students to have a good grasp of these issues, understanding those problems. It creates the opportunity for dialogue among different groups with different experiences. It creates the opportunity for students um, who are steeped in those issues in a lived way to have a, a, a perspective, a, a set of conceptual tools to understand it. For the, those students who don't live and have that lived experiences, they can form the kind of empathy that creates um, a need to be an ally, a need to, to be engaged. So, you know, I think it, it's really important to, to have those kinds of courses in the curriculum. Um, it's, it's very interesting that in the 60s, the academy was, you know, kind of forced to make black studies, Latinx studies, women's studies, a part of the curriculum. Um, and one of the things that happened in which I saw as an academic in that time is that all sorts of generative ideas and uh, conceptual apparatus came out of those, those intellectual movements and were integrated into the, into the regular curriculum. That it, it became, the, curric the general curriculum became so infused with um, the, the, the kind of concepts and tools of Black studies, Latinx studies, uh, gay and lesbian studies, that there was a, a, a sense that we had done the job of integrating these kinds of experiences into the academy. Yet we see in 2020, the demand to have that more, in, uh, more um, infused into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So this is a kind of way to give a booster shot, so to speak, to what we had thought we had won in the 60s and 70s into the curriculum. And our faculty, of course, responded, I think, very, very uh, strongly to, to that kind of um, booster. And I think our students are going to have a, 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 a great benefit from, from that uh, change in the curriculum. And that's what I'm most proud of. As a community member, I'm proud of that too. Just looking over the, the, the courses that are listed just in the spring semester alone was just incredible. So I'm really happy to see um, all yeah. of the vibrancy that's coming out of, of that initiative. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, Angela, this question, next question is, is geared to you. Um, so one of the many, many highlights of that initial uh, discussion during part one were your comments on a multiracial democracy, you shared, quote, we have to learn how to govern in a way that advances racial equity. We have to put policies in place. We have to figure out how to hold ourselves to account for how we are doing. Is it different? And how do we even do better? With that in mind, when progress is made, how can we continue to assess and measure the impact of the initiatives that we've undertaken? Hmm. Um. That's a good question. Um, how do we know whether or not we're really making progress? I think that that is our obligation, all of us, 
who think that we have leaned into this moment of racial reckoning and we're stretching it into a transformative movement, we need to have some benchmarks. We need to have some measurements. Um, when I said I had become chronically patient, that was not a good thing. Um, during that period of patience, I, with lots of colleagues across the country, sometimes across the world, were developing things. We were developing theories, language, tools, measurements, data sets. We were just heads down because we knew it needed to happen. The surprise is that the demand for it came so quickly, so such a vast array of institutions and people asking for it. That's what made me see that the patience that it took during times of outrageous oppression and suffering, just to put your head down and create what you knew was gonna be needed if ever the country woke up to the fact. And then it woke up all of a sudden. In that waking up, what I've recognized is that we have to now be impatient because time is running out. There was a time when we had time, but we don't have time anymore because democracy is under threat. The planet is under threat. The ability to be able to govern is being questioned. And in this moment, I think this is when you have to lead and those who see a future have to own their capacity and unique ability to birth that future. Um, what I'm about to say, I think is controversial. Um, it, it's controversial to friends because I have so many friends, young friends who are using the language of liberation. I came out of college into the black power movement to the language of liberation. And I question whether liberation is the language of today. I think that that notion of liberation misses the moment. This is not the moment to figure out how to break free. This is the moment to own your leadership and be free to lead. Because what the nation needs is exactly what people who have felt marginalized have developed. Because if you feel like an outsider, and if you have been made to feel like an outsider and you have figured out ways to move forward, you have a special quality that the nation and the world will need going forward because there's no longer going to be the ability to just lead based on your race or your gender. Leadership is going to come because we're listening differently. We're finding uncommon common ground. We're working out how to lead from the place of those who have been discriminated against and marginalized that not until we solve those problems will we unleash the talent that the nation will be dependent on going forward. And so I'm asking myself these questions. And so your, what I say to your question about measurement is we need to see how are, who are the leaders? How are the leaders seeing their role? How are they being accepted? Have we developed followership in this nation? We can see right now the angst that we're experiencing is that uh, nearly half the nation refuses to follow people of color. They refuse to follow people of color because of this hierarchy of human value and this insecurity. And only when we realize that the very people who have been discriminated against, marginalized, oppressed, and made vulnerable have within them the capacity that it's going to take to, to perfect the union, to have it be more perfect. That very language was about this moment. And now here we are. Thanks. Sometimes I forget I'm not an audience member. Thank you so much for that. Um, it's just so incredibly powerful. And I think it speaks volumes to how we can hold people accountable. Um, and I also want to say that this you are in a safe space to be uh, controversial. Those comments are always welcome here. <laughs> so thank you. They're controversial because I'm still working them out. But I thought I would share them because maybe <laughs> someone will know where to take them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So the uh, next question here we have uh, is directed actually uh, back to Julia. 
Um, so from, from your vantage point as a current parent and as a representative of the Family Association and Leadership Council, you are often asked how families can participate in building a more inclusive community that affords all students the opportunity to thrive. In essence, my question to you is, what role do you think that families and parents can play in cre creating sustainable change for a more inclusive environment? Well, you know, certainly families play an important role vis-a-vis -vis the individual or individuals that they are supporting through the college experience. And so I value that and want to honor that because they're an important part of the extended network uh, for many of our students. Um, and I also want to say something that uh, is sometimes controversial, uh, which is the idea that um, I know when, when I became a parent, it felt as though I had permission to care only about my child. And that was not okay with me because I, I believe as a community member, I have a responsibility to our children. Um, and to our young people. And um, I felt that way then. And that meant uh, sometimes having to think very carefully about, yes, what might be good for my son, but also what this means for the larger community um, and to do that at the same time. And so I feel as though one thing we can do is not only focus on the individual that we might be associated with, but to also be thinking about uh, the larger community and to bringing a, whatever resources we have to bear to this wonderful Pitzer community, right? To continue to strengthen it, to improve it, um, to be willing to criticize, speak up, make change. Um, so that may be uh, financial resources, uh, but it might also be uh, networking, internships, you know, uh, being available to talk with student groups about some of the questions that, you know, Jackie and Paris, you've, you've raised, you know, sort of writing statements, uh, talking about history and strategy, talking about context. Um, you know, I think there are so many different things that our broader Pitzer family community can bring to bear in this conversation um, that can support uh, students and the institution and staff. I mean, I've been so honored to work so closely with you, Brendan, and other staff. There's so much uh, value in this community. So uh, for me, I get an enormous um, uh, benefit from being uh, more active than I originally thought I would be. You know, when I when it was time to go to college, I didn't think I'd be as involved, right? Um, but I have to say, it's been incredibly rewarding because I. I see how much the, uh, the institution can benefit from family involvement uh, through the ways I've named internships, mentoring, networking, um, having conversations, reflecting your own students experience, uh, sharing that information, learning about other students experiences. And then I think in the end, for those students who might be struggling, um, being able to be familiar with resources um, and support them accessing those resources so that they can learn through that process that there really is a community there to support them. Uh, so I just see many different ways that we can all be involved, uh, depending on what we have to offer and, and what we're up for. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julia. Uh, Derek, a similar question to you as an alumnus and board member an involved member of the Pitzer community, what role uh, can alumni play in creating change and building community with individuals who may have encountered similar experiences? In your opinion, what a responsibility do other alumni have to reach back and pay it forward for current and future generations of Pitzer students? Um, I'm gonna reverse the question a little bit and talk specifically about the institution itself. The alumni can engage less the institution makes communication and a network uh, that is uh, targeted uh, to bring alumni into space. Uh, and it's not until alumni feel uh, a sense of inclusiveness, a uh, sense of belonging, uh, a connection with the institution. Uh, you frame out specific areas where folks can actually engage and be involved 
uh, the institution has to create uh, a sense of uh, um, uh, continuity around what both the current students and the current experiences that they're having, how that then aligns with the interests of former alumni. Um, I think it's those components, right? What, what's, what is the school producing uh, that uh, creates a, a sense of synergy where folks who were previously connected with the institution are willing to re-engage and reconnect? Uh, it's not until then, then you start having conversations about how the alumni can uh, support uh, and, and make themselves available to do more. Uh, as I stated before, you know, I, I'm connected with a ton of African-American alumni from Pitzer who have not engaged with Pitzer since they left Pitzer, right? And so there has to be a conversation about why that is. What's been the landscape analysis and the outreach strategies uh, that have uh, not taken place? And then what are the things that can be done to essentially do that uh, level setting uh, uh, and get people to recognize that there are opportunities uh, to re-engage and connect. Um, and I think it's those conversations and it's this dialogue and it's looking at, you know, the reconstruction of the, uh, the outputs uh, that then uh, put people in position of where they can then plug in. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, President Oliver, this next question is a year toward you. In our initial discussion, we have the pleasure of hearing, of course, from both you and Angela, a dynamic, timely conversation focused on the need for radical imagination in the pursuit of a multiracial democracy. You mentioned that you wrote the book, Black Wealth, White Wealth, in 1995 with your co-author, Thomas Shapiro, to really try to shift our focus to understand the sources of racial inequity in a much different way in a much more structural way. And it begins with a shift in perspective. Uh, my question for you is today, what do you see as one of the biggest assumptions people make about advancing equity and inclusion? I think um, there are a number of assumptions they make. I don't know if I can say the biggest assumption, <laughs> but um, I, I think that, uh, this is a this is a fragmented answer because it's fragmented. Not everyone has the same assumptions. People go into it with different assumptions. I think there's a segment of the population that sees the equity conversation and they look at what do I have to lose in this um, you know this deal. Equity means something is going to be taken away from me. And then, as I pointed out, there are those people who um, either have lived experience or are empathetic to the experience of people of color and the disenfranchised who um, see this as a way to um, um, create true equity um, in which you allow everyone to bloom to their fullest potential uh, because you set the kind of uh, framework that allows people to, to, to have their own um, expectation or to, 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 to get whatever their um, uh, growth potential is. Um, and then you have those who are just like fish in the ocean. Um, they don't see racism because it's all around them. It's like water and they're just going along with the stream. And so those, are, I think, are the dominant assumptions that they're going to lose something, we're going to create a, a, a greater equity, or we're just floating in the stream and I don't even see racism. And, you know, we're looking at a politics today in which um, recent elections show that there's quite a few in the first and the third assumptions um, where race is becoming, as Angela said, something you cannot um, uh, uh, run away from. And these are the ways people are, are many people are seeing it. And um, so it's a fragmented view. 
Um, even though we have, I think, set up um, structures for us to have these conversations, these conversations are not being equally um, uh, taken in. Thank you, President Alton. Uh, Jackie and Paris's question is actually uh, geared toward both of you. Perhaps we'll, we'll start with uh, Jackie for your initial response. Um, so now that we're in sort of the fourth installment and close of the True Equity series, at least for 2021, um, with, with, and with all that the, uh, you and other students are currently facing, what do you hope this increased awareness will bring to, will mean for the Pittsburgh community and in particular, our students. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah, um, I think one of the biggest things, I feel like we've been talking about a lot of, you know, having that awareness of what is happening on cam campus and there are things that are happening on campus that have been happening for the several years now that are the same. So having that knowledge and awareness of what is happening and also that creates like the calibrate collaboration that we're going to be having and working together to creating um, a safe space, safe environment, um, a sense of belonging for students of color that is really important um, for their well-being and their mental health is really important. And also another thing is also having that, um, as Derek mentioned, um, the disconnect between students and alumni. Um, I feel like that's really important. And I feel I we've heard it in LSU in our meetings. A lot of students do mention how there is a disconnect between there. And, you know, we don't really know a lot of the alumni who are Latinx, who identify as Latinx. Um, and I feel like having that knowledge, um, letting the community know that there is a disconnect, because I feel like it's really important to have that connection with alumni. Um, as I mentioned before, like, with the solid solidarity statement, um, we were clueless. We did we never done this before, and I know for a fact if we were connected with alumni and if we knew them, we could contact them. And you know they've been here before. They've been through these experiences before. They would know um, what it's like to be in that position and not having that sense like okay, we we've been here before. What what can we do now? And working together. Um, so that's definitely one thing I want to get out of this conversation to know that there's a disconnect and where there's something that needs to be done there um, to have that connection in place. Absolutely. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, same question to you, Paris. What are you hoping this increased awareness will mean for the Pittsburgh community and in particular for students? I think um, it sort of sums up um, a lot of the points that the panelists are making, but it's really about um, Am I still clear? I'm getting the unstable thing. Okay, good. Um, it's really about like knowing knowing your role um, within everything. I know I know my role um, within within BSU and like with uh, being a student organizer on campus and how to how to connect with um, admin. Also, of course, connecting with President Oliver, connecting with you, um, Brandon. So we're super, super grateful for those connections. Um, but now everybody can see we, we're still dealing with these problems um, decades, one decades later. Of course, we when we put out our BSU address last year, we were making parallels to the same demands that were um, made in the 60s. So we know that I think we, we all know we are definitely past the um, awareness stage. So now it's about how can what can you do? Um, and it's about like I said, it's about knowing knowing your role and being honest and being honest with that within that too. And even even wider, I know let's say in terms of like protesting, like maybe right being on the front lines. I know my role. I know I won't be there, but I know what I do do well. Um, I know I can like I said, I can organize students sorts of things. Um, I can run a mutual mutual aid fund. So I know how to, I know how to do those well. And it's, a, it's definitely about definitely the education factor. What can, what can you do and how can we get um, better? How can we get better connected um, with, as a community? We know, at least I guess, even with students, like, you know, that with between artworks, like for example, we've seen like BSU and LSU, we, we have, we have a great relationship. Um, we go beyond like the solidarity statements that we put out and like, like I said, being a part of this conversation, I said, oh, hold on, we need, we need LSU here too. Um, so like I, like I said, because I, I know, I know my role in that. Um, so yeah, we hear, we're just like, okay, yes, we want to get connected with our alums. So how do we make that um, an institutional 
definitely. Uh, I could agree with what you said, um, Derek. How do you make that an institutional um, move? Because it's, it's something that we want to see as students, but it's not necessarily something that we have time to, like, as, as students. Um, and definitely another another piece is getting connected um, with family CC. It's something that I didn't even I think about. I'm thinking about, like, oh, we're well, alumni. But, of course, we do have such a uh, robust network of, of families as well. Um, and everybody can know know the ways in which um, they can support um, what's going on on campus and, and it's put, in, put forth the word, put forth through the institution, then you know when we become alums, hopefully things will already be set up and we, we can give back um, in, in the ways in which you want to. Thank you so much, Paris. One of the things I'm really excited about will be the launching of a process which I'm hoping will streamline the connection between alumni and students which is the Pits or Connect communities that you two have both been very much so involved in and I'm hoping will be open to the community to, to, to share in and building those connections virtually uh, through Pits or Connect, which is of course a new platform that we launched uh, early in the fall. Um, thank you both for, for, for sharing that insight. Um, our, our next question again goes back to, to you, Derek. Um, so given your work in educational and organizational development, most recently as the director of Crossroads Equity and Justice Institute, I would imagine a large part of your professional experience has been focused on community organizing and creating an ethos in which equity and inclusivity has a chance to thrive. My question to you is based on your experience, how do you think educational institutions uh, can create and maintain safe spaces for students of color? It's a, it's a great question. It's also a, a bit complex because when you say educational uh, institutions, those institutions are also bifurcated, right? Are you talking about private institutions? Or are you talking about public institutions? Are you talking about institutions that are subsidized through, you know, um, uh, essentially uh, zip codes and, 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 and locations and, you know, depending on like the population that you have in class and, and the resources that you receive, uh, uh, the tax codes that have been in place uh, for eons in the United States uh, sometimes determine whether or not you get a quality education as opposed to um, places or institutions that charge uh, upwards of $40,000 a year in order to uh, subsidize everything that you need. Uh, so let's just talk about the separation of like educational institutions and what that actually then potentially produces in terms of, again, those networks, those access points. Um, and talk historically about, you know, the conditions of white flight and how these institutions actually got bifurcated to begin with, right? We're talking about really some historical, systemic, uh, um, really ingrained uh, um, American traditional norms that we don't really challenge frequently. Um, so that's the foundation, right? And that's really where some of the education, some of the work uh, some of the uh, continued advocacy and dialogue uh, uh, needs to also be elevated uh, so people get a real sense of uh, where inequities actually fester uh, and, 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 and spread. Um, but within those institutions, uh, making sure that if you have a seat at the table and if you are actually engaged in those conversations, you've been afforded an opportunity of leadership to uh, make sure that you're actually representing. Uh, for those uh, gaps, those voids, those uh, voices that aren't there, uh, that you can articulate what, uh, what an equitable um, environment may look like. Um, and then making sure that you are also having direct communication and conversations with the people who are impacted uh, by whatever is in need. I think one of the great things about this dialogue is that, quite frankly, it initiated from the ground up, there were students who, uh, through their lived experiences, were saying, we have to address this, right? Uh, it's through that advocacy, it's through that uh, level of an engagement and that agency that has shifted uh, most systems throughout history. Uh, it typically comes from folks who are being oppressed and subjugated into a, a very finite uh, corner of existence. Uh, and wanting to be able to like breathe uh, easily, be able to expand uh, their access, be able to engage uh, in, 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 in multi-layered opportunities without uh, having to, uh, quite frankly, uh, 
deal with the resistance of not being able to self self actualize. Uh, so I think it relates to you know Pitcher, um, President Oliver. I believe you were the first African American uh, president of this institution. It's a fantastic historical moment. Um, how long has the school been in existence, right? Um, I occupy a space at a affluent institution. I happen to be the first African-American to ever sit uh, at the administrative table in the 50 year existence of the institution. This is 2021. So we have to talk about those things, right? And, and really get a understanding that some of these institutions do not, they profess uh, to want change, but they also are very, um, they're very stringent about traditional norms being shifted, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so we have to challenge whether or not some of the acts and some of the things that are put in place are more performative or really about changing the uh, cultural norms of how these institutions function. That historical knowledge is so, so important. Um, thank you, Derek, again. Um, so, Angela, we're actually, we have a, just a couple more questions, but Angela, this one is uh, geared toward you. Um, another incredible highlight from our initial conversation was your comment that, quote, it's the time where we all have to step in and bring what I call radical imaginations, because the notion was never, the nation was never designed to be inclusive. And so we have to redesign our institutions and our agencies. My question to you based on that notion is how do we move forward as a community during a time of division and how can we redesign together? So I was just thinking as you were all talking about Pitzer and, and what's happening there, that one of the things that could come out of this is for Pitzer to decide for itself, what does it mean to be almost we're headed toward being past the first quarter of this century. So we're headed toward the middle of this century. What are we preparing young people to do? I contend that it is a world in which being able to finally resolve these issues of institutionalized, structural, societal racism will determine the future because we have gotten to a point in which it's not just people of color who are being harmed, the entire nation is at risk because it has failed to figure this out. So as we think about how to go forward, we really have to prepare students who are white, Latinx, black, Asian, all of them to lead in a multiracial society that we should never again have students coming out of college who are surprised to find out the history of slavery and reconstruction and redlining and Jim Crow and the great migration and the genocide of uh, indigenous people and their stolen land. None of this should ever be a surprise to anybody who has been through an educational system. And we have to then figure out how people, students who are white, understand that they have as deep a reason to get all of this as a student who is Black or a student who is Latinx or a student who is Indigenous. All people who plan to lead and contribute in the future need to understand the past so that they can lead and produce going forward. And so for me, as I think about radical imagination, clearly, I am talking about something that requires radical imagination, not only for our institutions, but for ourselves, that we can become leaders for all and to lead for all, you have to lead for those who have been most marginalized and discriminated against because you can't get to all if you can't include that. That we've got to figure this out. We have to have, for example, when, um, uh, President Oliver was talking about the issues getting infused throughout all of the curriculum. What I thought is nobody should teach an economics class that is not a Black economics class. Because you can't understand economics in this country if you don't understand how slavery was baked into the economy of the nation. Just can't do it. 
If you don't get that, you're not talking economics. You don't understand. We talk, we talk, we're having a fight for 15 and trying to deal with restaurant workers. The reason that restaurant workers were not included when we got the new deal and we got a minimum wage is because that used to be the work of black people. The servers were black. They were not going to allow black people to get that kind of treatment. And so people who were serving were kept out, but also people who were doing agricultural work because who was doing the agricultural work historically? It was black people. That is how the economy started. You can't talk about the economy without understanding black economics. I'm going to stop. You need to do your glasses. But I, I actually think that the future is going to be dependent on institutions like Pitzer understanding that no, it shouldn't be as Jackie was saying that we've got one little program. The whole thing has to be about the future. And the future is can we create a thriving multiracial democracy? Not only is the country, the country dependent on it, the world is waiting for it. It's going to take a different kind of leadership and places like Pitzer need to be producing that leadership. Absolutely. Goodness, thank you so much. That's actually a perfect segue into our, our final moderated question. We will open it up uh, for a few um, questions from, from the audience, of course. But um, this was sort of directed to the entire panel. As we begin to wrap up our questions for the evening, I would love to go around the panel, ending with President Oliver and hear from each of you a word or two that describes uh, your hopes for Pitzer through the lens of your own radical imagination. And maybe we will start uh, with you, Julia. Julia, I think you're on mute. Oh, I lost you for a second, right when you said my name. So here I am. <laughs> no, here I am. So um, a word, right? One word? Oh, no, it just uh, oh, oh, right. I'll say a few things. Oh, OK, so so I want to say something sort of about combining some of the questions that you posed to me and some of the questions that, you know, and the answers that I was, I was listening to folks, because I feel this uh, both and, you know, I do improvisation also. So I want to say like, yes, and, right? So I, I, I feel like uh, this idea that I want us to have a sense of, of urgency because it is heartbreaking to me that uh, we are hearing these stories across the generations um, and that we haven't taken action um, as we haven't gone as far as we needed to go. Right, so I want to see all of that fixed yesterday, and um, I want to have uh, you know change history now, and I want to guard against superficial answers. So I I want to not pretend as though we've taken care of that problem. Check check the box, you know we took care of it. It's done. We had a meeting, and now we've addressed the problem. So it's sort of a I want us to take all of this as seriously as possible do the things we know that need to happen, radically imagine, implement, make it happen, um, and make it genuine and real, mm -hmm. because uh, nobody should have to continue to uh, struggle or face the kind of marginalization that we are talking about. There are real harms as a result of this. This is not an academic exercise, even though the academy is involved, obviously, but this is not just an academic exercise. This takes time. Paris, Jackie, your colleagues, there, there are real harms that are done. So I, I want to um, just dig in. I'm hopeful um, and I feel uh, you know, compelled to act and uh, continue to work collaboratively uh, to listen, to learn, and to take whatever steps I can take. So that that would be my thinking at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. Uh, Derek, same question. What are your hopes uh, for Pitzer through the lens of your own radical imagination? Uh, radical imagination. Um, it'd be great that we are not having conversations about first, first African-American president, uh, first student to graduate with an engineering degree who's African-American, right? It'd be great to like not be in that position where we're in 2021, we're still talking about first 
Um, I think my radical imagination for the students is that students would be in a position where they can actually focus solely on their academics and not have to have this duality of like having to fight for change, be, you know, um, put in positions where they're having to uplift what their uh, lived experiences has been in the institution and not being afforded uh, the same access or rights uh, that other students are afforded. They can solely and 100% just be students, right? So there's an elimination of all the other isms that exist. Uh, so folks can fully actualize who they want to be in the future, right? Without having to have all the other things placed on shoulders. Um, radical imagination to just uh, just be, you know, I think that that's uh, a critical um, piece. I know that, you know, that was uh, what we had all hoped for when I was a student there. Um, and I guess that that would be my hope for students in the future is that when uh, Paris and Jackie are, you know, reaching back, uh, they are just providing uh, support for students and not talking about um, reoccurring themes. Uh, of being students in spaces that are occupied by uh, others. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Derek. Uh, Jackie, same question. What are your hopes uh, for Pitzer through your own uh, lens of radical imagination? Yes, I 100% agree with Derek, what he had to say. Um, yeah, I want students, specifically students of color, to just focus on academics. I this past semester and like with the incident that happened like um, regarding like the LSU and such. Um, one of the things I've never experienced this on campus. So having to be, you know, like the uh, co-president of LSU, I was really um, aware of everything that happened. I came to realization that we're, we always have feel this responsibility to do so much and to know that my I realized that my academics weren't even my priority for like a short amount of uh, time, which, you know, I came to college, this is, should be my priority. It should be academics, but having to, you know, um, educate others on things that they shouldn't be saying or doing, and that just shouldn't be the case. And also I agree with Angela about community and, you know, Pitts I came to Pitzer because of the community, you know, having that tight knit community that was, one thing I've always looked for in a college and, you know, I'm very hopeful with Pitzer since it is small and do we do have a tight community and having these conversations are so important. And, you know, I know other colleges aren't having these conversations. So that is a step forward. And I'm hopeful that these um, conversations continue in the future and having that. And I know Pitzer, I'm really hopeful for Pitzer in future generations that these incidents won't occur because of how tight our community can be. Thank you so much, Jackie. Uh, Paris, same question. What are what are your hopes for Pixar? I hope, and it's just kind of related to related to you over there in the lovely office of, of advancement, um, is that Pixar reaches um, a point a point of higher like financial stability, because um, of course uh, a lot of the things that we we envision are you know more black students, more black faculty, more black staff. It does require money, unfortunately. Um, and we, I want to see more, I want to see more on campus um, and, and expanding, expanding those things is going to, it's going to come, it's going to come with, uh, with funding. Um, and I, I know that, I know that reality and now I'm like, oh, okay, well, I want to see this, but then I know how things look like behind the scenes. I'm like, oh, okay, well, um, how, how does all that how that works out? So I would love to see Pitzer um, be at a higher point of uh, financial financial stability, um, and I would also um, just like to see things just become like institutionalized. Um, so when we with things that come out of like these conversations uh, become institutionalized. So um, whenever I graduate, whenever we all technically move on, there will still be like, things like structurally um, in place. And even by like wildest like dreams for everything to be organized into one like central office. So they go into a central office. I don't know what docs will be called, but and so that alumni and families and students and, and admin um, can come together like for uh, through issues of like 
diversity and inclusion and and it's not like scattered across campus but it's organized in one hopefully like a physical uh physical space so i would love to see that um as well uh, that second that i love that dream paris thank you so much for sharing that um angela similar question well, i think i already shared a radical imagination view so i'll just share another one i've been influenced by listening to derek i would love to see the black and brown alumni really come together and feel ownership and community with Pitzer and to utilize what they have seen out in the world and bring it in. I, I think that would just be a big boost for the institution and would help it to uh, be on speed up as it thinks about how to create this linkage into um, from, from the school to the world, from the school to the world. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Angela. Uh, and we will, um, final question, hopes for Pitzer through the lens of your own imagina radical imagination, President Oliver. Well, I would, I would take everyone's um, uh, vision and say, I would love to have all of those things happen. But one of the things that I recognize is that Pitzer really reflects the larger society. We bring people in from all walks of life. And we have to recognize that if we want to have a different Pitzer, it requires us to be able to deal with all of these conflicting visions, views, and perspectives. So I would hope that in the future, we have the mechanisms, we have the, the, the structures, we, we have the institutionalized uh, ways of dealing with um, uh, these differences where we can be a campus that can do that peacefully. We can do it without harm to people. It becomes part of the educational process and it's a laboratory for the multiracial democracy that Angela talks about because I do believe that that's where Pitzer has its comparative advantage. We are an institution that engages our students to be more than students, to be a part of the governance of the institution. And in being part of the governance, they learn how to work through conflict, um, work through difference and create a, not a common, but a shared perspective. And that shared perspective comes out of that engagement. And I think that's where Pitzer makes such a big difference. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, President Oliver. Um, so I, I think we have time for, for one question uh, before we close out. Um, and I, I want to give the opportunity to, to our students who are joining us today. So this question uh, comes in here live. Let's see. Uh, what does coalition building look like between the affinity organizations on campus? So perhaps, for example, the affinity board. Uh, and do Jackie and Paris see it as a successful method to create more sustainable and visible change? So I'll pass it over. Uh, maybe Paris. Mm -hmm. I was oops, I gotta go first. Um, yeah, I definitely, we, we share um, a lot of similar experiences. Um, being being on this be on this campus um in, in relation to what we can go through outside the classroom inside the classroom we share similar experiences um so it's definitely about coming coming together to have conversation about those experiences um in order to um build coalitions and like i was uh, kind of touching on earlier um about putting putting yourself in certain positions like on campus so i've been i know like Fanny said i'm always busy i'm running around campus doing things but i i did that um strategically so that i can be a part of these conversations and i can bring in other people that um that i work with and that are on the same page as me um but also at the same time of coalition building between um other um marginalized groups uh we also have to how do i say this um we also have to like acknowledge like the the problems that we can have between like our organization so how can we 
have fruitful conversations about like anti-blackness um, in other communities and how do we like move forward to work together um, on campus because that would be it was it's always it's always amazing when people um, do come together um, for for a unified vision we know we know we have the same we pretty much want the same thing so how can we um, work together to make all of our experiences um, better on this campus. Thank you, Paris. Jackie? Yeah, I agree 100% with Paris. She said it beautifully. Um, I also agree that it's really important for all like the fitty groups to be together and have the same conversations. I know we already have an ID board that has a bunch of conversations for us, but I think it will also be important. I know Brandon mentioned having a dinner. Um, so bringing, you know, these affinity groups together is really important. And I know we are taking those steps forward, which is, I'm also really excited for that as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think we might have time for, for perhaps one more question. Um, if we have any coming in, happy to, to share with the group. There is a second question in the chat. Oh, has something to do with critical race theory. Um, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll actually like to speak to that. That I do think that we need for all people who understand the importance of having an honest telling and learning of the history of the nation, that people all who believe that need to speak up for it. Do not sit silently and let people dismiss that. We know there is nothing wrong with learning history and we need to not let the language trip us up. It is not a theory that this country had slavery. That's a fact, it's not a theory. I don't have a theory about the land having been stolen uh, for the purpose of building wealth. That's not a theory. We need to just put that language aside. Critical race theory is about something very specific. It is not the same as just learning the true history of the nation. We have an obligation to stand up for that. And if all of the people in this country who know we have an obligation stood up for it, we wouldn't be having a debate. We wouldn't be having a debate. Too much silence. I touch on that a little Amen. bit. Amen. Absolutely. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I was I was kind of reflecting um like on the like the um the my reaction to like critical um race theory in another uh, course that I'm taking. Um and there was all there's like the pushback of like how uncomfortable um it will make people feel and I just want to just touch on if it's uh, if it's uncomfortable for you to uh, learn about it how uncomfortable you think it is for us to go through it um on a daily basis so the, the least you can do um is be educated and educate yourself thank you for saying that it's so true thank you so much uh, any other thoughts or comments or we'll pass it over to President Oliver for final thoughts before we close. Well, Brandon, thank you for leading a very interesting conversation, one that I hope uh, people have found useful. Um, I know that every time I have this conversation with Pitzer constituents, um, I feel so fortunate to be at an institution where people care so deeply and are engaged with the issues and who have something to say that is uh, truly thoughtful and, and interesting. Uh, more importantly, it's, it's crucial, um, as Angela puts, puts it, for um, our society, for the world, to come to grips with these uh, very, very difficult questions. And um, I'm just very proud that we are taking these initial steps and not stopping, but moving forward and going to the next step and the step after. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I would like to just uh, extend a thank you to our incredible panel today. I just appreciate you sharing your time, insight and experiences with our community. Um, and as a reminder, all four segments will be available online at Pitzer at Home True Equity webpage. And we look forward to continuing our true equity programs in the spring of 2022 and beyond. Uh, on behalf of Pitzer College, thank you to everyone who attended today's discussion. I hope that you all have an incredible rest of your evening. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much, Take everyone. Take care. Bye.